God is holy and just and light. Then Dad's, Dan said, okay, I want you to take that list and I want you to turn it over. And now I want you to write down how you feel about God. And instantly some words came into my head and they were very different from what I'd written down before. God is angry. God is distant. God is punitive. He's fickle. He doesn't listen to me. And God had to begin to heal my heart from all those distorted beliefs. That was what I really felt and believed about him. And that's what I was living out of him, not the head information that I had about the scripture. It was those deeper beliefs that were driving me. And it was during this time, as I was really learning to connect with God and with men and women in the church, that I moved slowly back into ministry and started leading a home group. One night, the very first night I was leading the group, a young lady came into the group. She was the first one there because she was a visitor and all the regulars came late. <clears throat> and um, it's kind of a funny story. One of my roommates had left some tater tots in the oven at about 600 degrees <laughs> because he wanted to cook them fast because he had to go someplace. And um, he forgot about him. And so I started to notice this smoke billowing out of the kitchen. And she's sitting there on the couch, her leg on the coffee table. And she wasn't being rude. She'd hurt her leg. So she asked if she could do it first. And I said, sure, go ahead. But I'm running around opening windows and taking the little burned tater tots outside. And I, th I thought about her. I thought, she's cute. But, you know, I was focusing on clearing the smoke. And then I had to fo focus on leading the group because it was my first night doing that. So I, I set that thought aside. And then a few months later, some of the other women in the group started asking me, so what's up with you and Judy? And I thought, how do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> how do they know what I'm thinking before I know? Um, <laughs> I was being so careful to treat her the same as the other women in the group. Um, but there it was. I saw that Judy was someone who loved God and loved people. She was smart. She was relational. Um, I, I, I tend to retreat a little bit and be a little bit more reserved. And if she were here today, she would think, oh, you know, a bunch of new friendship potentials. <laughs> and you would love her too. She was committed to growth and change. She was learning about God's grace, and she was very attractive. We started dating the next year, and then we broke up. I was really frightened of connecting with a woman. I mean, here I was in my 20s, uh, probably about 30 at that point, and I'd worked so hard to enter the world of men. And now I had to go back and try to connect with a woman, and I didn't know if I was healed enough. Um, if the struggle would come back at, at full strength after we were married? And how would she respond when I told her about my past? It was scary. It, it was like being an adolescent all over again. But I found out when we broke up that I really missed her. And I was thinking about her a lot. So we started dating again. And I asked her to marry me in January of 1993. We were married that July. It's been 15 years now. Marriage is not proof of my healing. There are plenty of men who marry who have same-sex attractions. But for me, marriage was a gift from the Father. And marriage doesn't mean that I've never had any attractions to men, or to women for that matter. I just choose not to identify myself by those attractions and not to act on them. And the attractions have really, really diminished and dissipated over time. And just as marriage is not proof of healing, neither is having children. There are plenty of broken people who have children. But again, God blessed us. He gave us three sons. Nathaniel was born in 1997, and Aiden and Brendan were born in 2000. Three wonderful, very active boys. <laughs> Psalm 68.6 says that God sets the lonely in families and leads forth the prisoners with singing. And certainly he has blessed me and my family. In the book of Jeremiah, God gives the prophet Jeremiah a commission. We read, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. 
This verse becomes a theme throughout the whole book of Jeremiah. And it, when I read it, I remember thinking, this is a picture of what God has done in my life. The Lord uprooted sin and guilt and shame and fear, self-hatred and envy in my life. He tore down defenses and barriers that I had built to keep people away and to keep him away. He destroyed lies that I believed, false views that I held of him and about other people. And he overthrew the idols that I worshipped. And God did this not because he's mean, but because those things, sin, lies, shame, idols, they'll destroy us. They're like cancer eating away at the body. And he wants them removed and he removes them from our lives. And then... After removing those things, God built and planted a new identity, new ways of thinking and living, new relationships, a new heart, and new attitude. And I'm so thankful and grateful to him. You know, at at the beginning, I said I was going to tell you my story. But really, my story is just a small part of God's story and of the work that he does in this earth and in people's lives. It's a story of his deep love and his forgiveness, his power to transform. So thank you for letting me share my story with you.